I just wanted to open up with a, a, a conversation of what we're seeing in regards to trends and housing needs assessments that I actually is sort of alarming um, in the kind of oversimplification of housing needs assessments. So we'll start with a bit of a conversation. Um, through that conversation, there's also be a chance for you to jump in. So grab your phones because you'll be able to um, insert stuff using Slido. And at the end, I'll talk about the housing needs toolkit that we're releasing um, at the end of October. So I'm just going to start presenting here. One second. Oh, I muted myself. Let's see. Aluka, can you see that? Everyone can see my screen, yeah? Yes. Awesome. And can you see my notes or just the screen? Just the screen. Let's see. Awesome. Oh, uh, someone raised their hand. Okay. So I'm Jesse Donaldson. I'm EVP of Strategic Services here. I oversee the consulting team and actually many of our housing needs assessments. Um, so look forward to chatting to you today. So I think it's tempting for us to think uh, more data in regards to housing needs assessments should lead to uh, clearer, simpler answers. But in housing, I think more data doesn't always simplify. Oh, here, my slides are moving. So I think really what it does, it, it or should do, if we have a housing and needs assessment that's strong, is it should reveal the intricate and also interconnected issues at play that are impacting housing needs within a community. I think housing needs assessments are not just about the homes that are needed, but it's about nuance. So who needs those homes? What kind of homes? What services should a company? Where should those homes be? What type of housing should it be? I think data tells us that housing is housing instability is not a single issue problem. And everyone on this call knows that it's not a single issue problem. Um, but what I'm gonna present shortly here is this sort of trend towards housing needs being simplified, oversimplified uh, and standardized, which I think is creating a situation where we're not getting what we need, uh, meaningful solutions that are highly localized. So a simplistic approach to a housing need prioritizes unit numbers. But I think if we collect uh, deeper data, what I'm going to show to you, it forces us to look deeper. So address the full ecosystem of employment, health, social services that surround housing. And all of us who work in this space intuitively know that. Yet what I've seen over the last several months is a convergence to these standardized housing needs templates that are masking those individual differences um, at a local level. Here. Oh. I lost my thing here. Okay, so what I was told by the business development team is we want you to come talk about simplification of housing needs assessments. And I 99% agree with them. I do think there are opportunities to simplify processes, simplify how we analyze data, use new tools like AI. But I also think in the kind of quest to simplify what we can't do, is lose the depth of thought and analysis that's needed for us to really build meaningful housing solutions or keep us accountable to what it is that we're building. Oh, it's changing so slowly. Hmm. Okay, so housing needs assessments, the truth is, is I don't think they need to be simple because they're not. Housing isn't simple. Well, I can see stuff in the chat here. People just introducing. Oh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, housing needs assessments aren't simple. Housing is incredibly complex and it crosses so many different sectors and issues and levels of government and policy. And so how do we make the process practical and simple while not masking some of the complexity that we need to acknowledge in order for us to come up with a, you know, effective housing needs solutions for a local area. I don't know why my slides aren't turning. <laughs> Doing our best here. Okay, so I think we can have lots of data, we can have complexity, but still manage it in a man, still deliver it in a manageable way. And so I think if we embrace the complexity, which we'll show you more of today, not shy away from it, 
we'll get closer to those solutions. And so one of the big things I think that's changed in regards to housing needs assessment was the federal template that came out. And that really interestingly, only asked for 2021 data mostly, there's some comparisons and it's a fairly surface level um, perspective on housing, N not to say it's wrong. So I get that meeting the federal requirements could be the difference between you getting $30 million for housing or, or none. So the box checking is really important. But when we look to the requirements set up by the feds or even the BC requirements, what they're asking for helps them make decisions. I would argue that it actually doesn't help you entirely figure out what's needed in your community. So it will unlock funding, but I'm not sure it actually provides us the roadmaps we need to go where you need to go. And I think we've been a victim of that ourselves here at HelpSeeker sometimes. We've created kind of templates and ways to standardize needs assessments. But what I'm sort of challenging you and, and ourselves is how do we move towards a needs assessment that meets the requirements, but also gets community stakeholders on board, also helps council to understand why that's essential, tells us exactly what kind of housing and for who and where and when they'll need it. And so I think we can push further to create not just documents or plans, but artifacts that will help us make decisions um, in the next in the coming years. So before I kind of prattle on, this is your chance to jump in. So grab your phone and you go to slido.com or you can do the QR code and just put in the number there and you can answer this question. We'll see how many of you are conducting needs assessments. Okay, so we have some people planning on doing in the coming months. 55% just completed one. Awesome. We have some people. I'm just here for fun. Okay. The fellow data and housing nerds, we appreciate you coming. Okay. So nearly how? About a third. We're planning them in the coming months. Okay. Well, I look forward to hearing if uh, this has any impact on how you might approach it. Let's go to the next question. What are the greatest challenges right now you face in completing a housing needs assessment? Is it resources? Is it data capacity? Is it stakeholder engagement? Yeah, resources for sure. Okay, so, okay, so resources is a theme. Stakeholder engagement. Yep, we'll talk about that today. Knowledge on how to complete one. Inconsistent data. Lack of capacity and resources. So here I am saying we should be collecting more data. We should make it more complex at the same time that there's significant rural, um, excuse me, rural, significant resource constraints. Need for local data. Yep. Putting it in a way that the council or other stakeholders will understand and buy into. So some common themes here. Okay, while I don't have a secret pot of money for resources and capacity, what we do have, and I'm excited to talk about at the end, is a housing needs toolkit that will help you for some of those people who are saying lack of knowledge about how to create, how to do this, where to start, what data to use. And so look forward to sharing that with you. Lack of relevant data, absolutely. Okay. So my thesis, my argument, if you will, is we shouldn't aim to simplify complex social problems by reducing the data we consider. So instead, if we can bring in as much data as possible and use techniques that simplify the analysis without limiting the depth or the range of our understanding. And so, um, especially for those communities who don't have a lot of data, how do we focus on getting novel data that we don't usually consider within housing needs assessments? and bring that into the pile to come up with some meaningful results without overburdening departments and individuals who are already hugely um, resource constrained. So if we dive into housing needs assessments, my kind of goal for the, the people we work with, the partners we work with, is looking beyond just how many houses, looking beyond that kind of rudimentary projection modeling that's required in the federal template want to look at real issues. So when we go into a community, oh, wow, that's a tricky, 
uh, infographic. When we go into a community, we want to look at stuff like what are the hidden displacement patterns? What's the effects of housing instability on long-term community health? I know more and more communities are looking at a public health angle, which is amazing because public health data tends to be really strong. What are the social networks that help or hinder access to housing? What are some of the um, structural inequities that exist within a community? Or imagine Mary. So Mary's 48 years old. She receives disability assistance. She goes to dialysis three times a week and she lives on a fourth floor walk up. Every time after dialysis, she walks upstairs alone and without any support. Of course, a four, fourth floor walk up isn't appropriate for Mary. So how do we, through housing needs assessments, through data, find the Marys in the community? And then how do we add that all up in an effective way to say, this is the story of housing needs in our community beyond the 32% that have, you know, are in core housing need. And how do we kind of collect those individual stories, but tell that at a community level as well? The more layers we can collect, the more useful our questions will get. And although there's limited data in some areas, the traditional housing data, there's a lot more data accessible for communities than we often think, if we sort of think outside the box of things that would be useful. And we've done a lot of work on how to take newly released economic data and apply that even to smaller communities. So how do we work with what we have and not lose kind of the, the complexity of the issue by limiting ourselves to the, the usual suspect data? So if we stop, oh, if we stop asking how do we build more housing or just that's an important question, but just asking how do we build more housing, we can start asking more interesting questions. So why are people being excluded from housing? And we can also ask, oh, this my slide's not working again. Oh, okay. Uh, what structural inequities are driving the crisis? So if we look at Anna, Anna, single mother working two jobs, She's stuck on the affordable housing waiting list for three years. Um, rents keep rising and she's a, a, in fear of ev eviction. She also commutes two hours each way to work um, because public transit is far from where she's located and that's the only housing she can afford. Meanwhile, families who live closer to their work have better schools, they're able to afford transit. So using data, a combo of transit data, qualitative data, housing data, we can tell those stories and then we can aggregate it up to tell a kind of a, a richer picture than what I've seen in housing needs assessments over the last couple of years. Hmm. I don't know why. what's going on here. Okay. I think data also forces us to engage with underlying problems that we'd rather avoid and, and maybe not the people in this room, but the conversations that are ugly are difficult or hard to get political buy in. And I think if we can do needs assessments in a different way, we can unpack some of those and surface some of those. So, of course, some of you have seen this almost 10% of accidental substance related deaths involved unhoused individuals, even though they represent 1% of the population. I haven't seen any housing needs assessments talk about that or acknowledge that. We haven't written any recently that have that angle in it. So telling that story of, of kind of um, preventable harm within the com community is one way that we can start to position new and novel data within these narratives. It's uncomfortable, but I also think it's important to talk about. And there's several uncomfortable topics we're missing often in housing needs assessments. One of those being uh, climate, but another being substance use. Data, I think, if we do it right, can, can push us outside of our comfort zone. And again, maybe not the people in this room, but the councils who have to approve it, the provincial governments who need to provide housing, the media outlets, the people that don't want housing in their backyard, so how do we build these needs assessments that push our thinking a little bit further than, you know, this is the average income that we have, median income this year, and this is how it's grown. Housing assessments show the messy, uncomfortable truth um, that short-term solutions won't address in these sort of entrenched issues. 
like system, system, systemic racism in housing markets. And I'm gonna show you in our qualitative research framework and interview protocol later, which we're gonna share with all of you. We have a whole section on uh, landlord engagement and, and racism and systemic discrimination and how that's impacting housing. Because if when these housing needs assessments, we don't ask about it, we won't write about it, and we won't do anything about it. There's also the disconnect as another example between where housing is built and where people work. And that's one of the things that was recently added to the federal template. And that's in can be a really complex problem or it can be a relatively easy problem in regards to data. And so we'll have more guidance in our toolkit about how you can approach that. So we'd love to hear from you, especially the ones um, who have completed their housing needs assessment, but everyone what uncomfortable truths about housing have you encountered in your own work or communities? And we can't see you by the way, it's anonymous. So your name isn't connected at all. Yes, very difficult to resolve NIMBYism. Been fueled by huge media and political tensions right now. Absolutely. There's been a passing of buck between different levels of government and a, and a wash hands up in, in many instances. Hmm. Affordable to the system versus affordable. Yeah, it's not a person-centered definition of affordable. Newcomers, yep, newcomers and system exploitation of newcomers. Who will only rent to others within their group. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and we've seen documented also huge, huge discrimination amongst Indigenous populations in all communities, yep. Interesting, community members are linking unhoused people and Indigenous community. So a lack of awareness about who is homeless, why they're homeless, and not stereotyping. Yep, governments, I, I wonder if you're from Ontario, the governments, provincial governments pushing uh, mandate for homelessness and housing down. Hmm. Yep, maintaining growth and achieving widespread affordability. Let's do a couple more. Zoning. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I think um, definitions for sure. Absolutely. And that's one of my uh, gripes. I get we have to standardize. I get the benefit of the federal template. But when we talk about affordability and experience of housing and core housing need or LGBTQ2S populations who can't find a place to live, it, it really doesn't tell the story um, of the realities of what people are facing on the ground, nor what we need to solve for. Okay, thank you for that. I'll just let the last two people who are typing enter. I don't wanna cut you off. Yeah, affordable and deeply affordable and NIMBYism as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, and simplicity looks good in reports. We are constantly here at Help Seekers saying, how do we make this simple? How do we make this digestible? Um, and in that pursuit, it becomes easy to lose meaning and realness and person-centered approaches and not being able to articulate the full scope of the problem. And like you mentioned here is, is it enough to say that 25% of older adults are in core housing need? Okay, that's, that's interesting. Is it really useful to inform a roadmap for how you build housing? So I think the other part of the story for me right now that's missing with housing needs assessments is it, it's also meant to, measuring complexity allows us to 
uh, measure accountability. And we're doing these housing net needs assessments as sort of a, a one and done in many instances. But how is what we've collected and what we've positioned, how is that helping us to later measure accountability for the things that we said we would do? And so instead of mo moving from, okay, well, we, we built 35 houses, how can we build data systems and processes that helps us later answer, okay, who moved in? Did they stay? What challenges did they face? Was that an effective response to what we heard the need was? And so if we don't start ourselves up for success with that initial housing needs assessment, the accountability mechanisms and measures afterwards uh, also genuine, generally aren't in place. So housing, my computer's frozen now. Okay, the housing data driven housing needs assessments, they don't allow for kind of easy victories if we do them properly, but they should be able to be something we refer back to and say, hey, this is what we heard and this is what we dug into, and this is how well we're doing against that beyond the kind of housing projections. All right. The more, the, the more complex we can make our assessments, the more precise I believe we can um, measure our accountability. Okay. So from your perspective, how do we use data to improve accountability for housing outcomes beyond the initial step of a housing needs assessment? What would it look like to be accountable to what we found in a housing needs assessment? Five, six, grab your phones if you got them. Comparable data over time, yep. Trend analysis. Mm -hmm. What types of things indicate success, you think, later? Units built, annual updates, absolutely. Meaningful, I would love to hear kind of thoughts on meaningful metrics. some comments in the chat. Oh, okay. Not for me. Data to tell a story. Absolutely. And I think that's sort of, again, I'm not picking on any housing needs assessments. We have to check the box. And if with limited resources, we got to do what we need to do to get the funding. But I do think what's kind of devoid in the current template is telling that story. Okay, I'll give those four more people a chance. Yes, whoever wrote that, I like that, the second derivative elements. Data that follows an entire person's journey, absolutely. And can we do that not only on an individual level, a case study, but on a macro level? Mm-hmm. So equity for equity seeking groups. Okay, three more and then we'll move on. Yeah, how needs are evolving over time, which is so interesting because the, the macro data of core housing need or median income or percentage of single parent families doesn't actually allow us to get down to need in a meaningful way. It gets us started, um, but needs are so specific and layered for individuals and for communities and for neighborhoods. All right, let's move on. Thank you guys. See if my slides will work. Okay, 
So I think I've, I've been clear is how do we move to more complex data sets? I'll give you an example of a couple of things that I've been thinking. And again, for those of you in the room saying resources are a challenge, I'm not trying to beat up on you and say you've got to do this and this and this. These are really just ideas. And our challenge at Help Seeker is how do we take these ideas and how do we enable um, people like you to do them better and faster? So you're not losing complexity, but uh, you're not adding resources. So one of the things um, I just completed a paper on heat vulnerability um, after the tragic heat dome uh, that happened, of course, in, in BC a few years ago, but there also has been one in Montreal. And the likelihood of uh, large scale heat related death in the next few years uh, in multiple communities across Canada is, is still significant. And one of those things is it's very, very tied to housing vulnerability, specifically actually three and four floor walk ups with no air conditioning. So one of the things I've been asking myself and asking the team is why aren't we including climate data in our housing needs assessments when, when we're partnering? Um, because it has such a massive impact to us, particularly for community housing and rental housing, and that will only increase as time goes on. Um, as I said, many municipalities are underestimating the risk of heat-related deaths. There are actually very few municipalities, particularly in southern Ontario, uh, that aren't at risk, um, in, especially with aging community housing stock. Also, I don't know if anyone from Montreal is on the call with us, but a few weeks ago, there was severe flooding that devastated uh, basement apartments in Montreal. And now some of the narrative is, well, and, and some of those apartments have been flooded three, four times over the last few years. And so we're asking from a bylaw standpoint or a zoning standpoint, whether it will even make sense to continue to have basement apartments at minimum in this area, but moving forward. Again, given that basement apartments are essential, a second suites that are also underground to improving or increasing housing stock, are we thinking about the risk of climate change threatening large swaths of our housing, deeply affordable housing stock? So that's again, just another example of where we can take novel data or different data sets and look at housing in, in a slightly different way, or in a way that we say, hey, we really should be thinking about that. I think public health is another opportunity for, for blending those. Um, just go to the next slide. Other areas we've been looking at have been affordability, health, transit. Transit is a new requirement as a federal um, template. And then economic shifts. We're doing a study right now on the impact of income. So clawbacks specifically for in Ontario and the impact that has on food bank usage and overall kind of affordability. And so one of the things we've kind of recently discovered is income disparity, income disparity has actually worsened over the past few years, which won't be a surprise to anyone. But like post COVID, with Canadians at the bottom, for, in the bottom 40% of income, having their dollar not go as far as those in the top 24%. Because of one of our census, when our census was done, a lot of that information isn't being properly or effectively um, integrated into housing needs assessments because we're relying on sort of older census data. But when we start to look at these new economic trends that are actually come out quarterly, nationally and provincially, we can extrapolate on what that might mean for local communities. So again, you don't always have to have local data, but how do we take some of this newer and fresher data, understand the story of what's happening, and then how that might impact housing in your community. Hmm. So this is the next slide, what themes or data sets should we be exploring in housing needs to bring more complexity? So think of anything you want. Don't think about whether it's practical or not. I've listed public health, climate, economic, but what other things can you think of? Transit.
addictions, mm -hmm. accessible housing. I think it's a conversation we're not having, particularly with an uh, aging population, but the intersection of, of age, loneliness, and disability, walkability, mm -hmm. basic needs, crime, yeah, intimate partner violence, Engaged residents often have more robust support networks. Mm -hmm. The local connections we forge, that decentralization of, of support, healthy food. These are great. Access to goods and services. A lot of what we do for those who know us is uh, supply mapping. So mapping that and then creating distance scores of how close or far neighborhoods are uh, for, from social supports, from parks, from free recreation. Indigenous peoples and newcomers, I agree. And, and what type of housing, are there other different housing requirements? Laundry in sweeter court, that's very interesting. Laundry is a huge expense, especially for families. What else would bring kind of meaning and depth to housing needs assessments? And what I'll do is I'm gonna take all these and think about ways that we can advice we can give you in representing it or different data sets you can use to tell those stories. Yeah. Oh, two more and then we'll just go to the next slide if it'll let me. Student housing need. That's coming up more and more and certainly in Ontario, I'm here in Toronto, we're seeing much more conversations about exploitation of internet, international students. Um, and really adverse housing conditions. Safety, housing safety, we don't generally see in housing needs assessments. And it's interesting with the, at least Ontario, with the new community wellbeing and safety strategy updates coming out in July, makes me wonder the intersection of safety and wellbeing and all those reports that are coming out and how that sits against the housing needs assessments that are happening. and. And are they speaking together and do they need to? But I'm seeing a lot of safety here from you here. Transportation, for sure. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Let's cross our fingers, see if it'll work. Okay, the last thing I'll do before I talk about the toolkit is, is talk about the qualitative data because that has been a passion of mine, a reignited passion over these last few months. We've had the privilege of doing some really large qualitatively focused projects with the city of Burnaby, um, the city of Victoria, and taking huge amounts of qualitative data and, and treating them with the same rigor that we do um, quantitative data. What I see, and historically we've done too, is qualitative data gets relegated to a what we heard section, which is great. That is really important and it's really important to kind of be bringing back what we heard. Where I think it's more challenging in the context of housing needs assessments is how do you reconcile what you heard from the, and the qualitative information with the quantitative and how together side by side do those tell a new story? And I actually think that's really sort of complex to do. So you can see it here in the federal template. Admittedly, it says you need it, but look at how it's positioned. What information is available that reflects the housing need or challenges of priority populations in your community? If no quant is available, please use qualitative information. Okay, most of us could do that in our community without asking anybody, which is fine. That's perfectly fine when you need to complete this template to get the resources you need to buy house or to build housing. But if you need a roadmap for what you're gonna build and where you're gonna build it, it needs you need more information than that. And then second, please describe local factors that are believed to contribute to homelessness in your community. Again, that's a really good question. That's a big question. So how do we tackle questions like that in a deep and systematic way without draining resources? So my question to myself and the team uh, and you is how do we move beyond that? And how as help seeker do we enable not just the partners who you know are our paid partners, but everybody, how do we contribute to the overall social good of what data we're collecting in housing needs assessments and, and what we're doing with it? If we treat 
qualitative and quantitative with the same rigor, which is very difficult to do. So any academics in the room, anyone who's gone through kind of thesis and done ethnographic work, the, the old, old school way is you print it all out and you take a highlighter and you code it by hand or you use something like Qualtrics. And that's a painstaking process that take, can take months. And that's just not realistic for I know many of you. So how do we take that same kind of rigor and, um, and the same rigor we use with the quantitative and do it in a more practical way? I think I'm, I'm preaching to the converted, but the, the importance and reflection for us here at Help Seeker is these are lived, people's lived experiences, people's realities, and those need to shape these housing needs assessments as much as the, the core housing need and the income stats. Let's go next slide. One of the reasons qualitative is so difficult, and we've been trying to crack both lately, and I've heard this from multiple communities, is there's gathering the stories and then there's analyzing them meaningfully. And in the gathering of stories, I've had two municipalities, one smaller and one quite large in the past four weeks, tell me that they did community engagement processes, not for housing, for something else, that flat out failed. Like no people went to them. In all honesty, about six weeks ago, we did one and three people <laughs> came to it. And so one of the things we've really done is move away. Post-COVID, civic engagement is low in lots of areas of our life. People don't have time to sit in a three-hour design lab to talk about what they need for housing. They're working two jobs. They're taking care of their children. They're trying to make dinner. They're trying to put food on the table, or they're trying to figure out where they're going to sleep. And so one example of how we've moved towards a more of an equity-based approach is we've created these things that are not novel in some ways, but pop-ups. So we take our clipboards, we take a whack load of Timbits, and we go to locations in the community that we're working. We go to Dollarama, we go to outside of the recreation center, um, we go to trans busy transit stops, and we talk to people for 30 seconds about their experience with housing, their experience with safety. And that's one of the things that's been kind of most effective for us. So my point is these kind of um, how we think about stakeholder, stakeholder engagement needs to shift and we need to find mechanisms to get to people. A second thing is really difficult is, like I said, it's hard to analyze. If you have 450 amazing conversations, it could take you weeks and months to sort through that in a reasonable way, but also to represent that data in an accurate way. And that's one of the things I think we've kind of cracked a little bit and I want to share with you because it's, it's free. It's easy for you to do as well. I think my computer doesn't like these fancy, fancy movements, graphics we have. Um, so our question is, how do we take these narratives and people's stories and weave them into a housing needs assessment that uh, tells both stories? Hmm. AI. <laughs> so if any of you have come to our webinars, it won't be a surprise that our answer is AI, and there's something counterintuitive about saying AI is the way we can respect people's stories. Um, but we've developed some techniques that, again, you can use that will help you, I think, actually respect the story and tell that community story in a way that's much more accurate and not as resource heavy as doing it all by hand. So it's not in the way you think. Um, it's not just uploading it to AI and telling it what you need to know. It's about um, hold on, sorry. I'll just fast forward. Okay, so what AI has been helped us to do, we recently did a project with City of Victoria and they had a really successful survey, over 1600 survey responses, or I forget exactly what, and a lot of it was open text. And, and before AI, that was a no-no, that would take a long time but they actually got really, really incredible rich data, um, tens of thousands of data points. And instead of us cherry picking or having to shortcut the analysis of that data, what we were able to do is actually create an AI driven system to code and tag that information and sort it. So we were able to represent it in a, a much deeper way. The cool thing about AI too is it helps you to uncover patterns and 
and um, that you wouldn't ordinarily or that you wouldn't yourself. So by assuming different roles with AI, you can analyze the data against some of your own biases. So I'll, show you, I'll give you an example here. Okay. So this is the roles here. So what we did, um, and you can do with anything, is one of the roles we recently used is we redacted all of the qualitative information. So we removed anything that was personal. We made sure it was all kind of private. And then we use not the front facing GPT, we have our own sort of LLM model, but for this, this sake and what you can use, we said act like an equity informed facilitator tasked with analyzing qualitative interviews from individuals with lived experience of housing affordability challenges. Identify recurring themes and patterns of inequity that may be overlooked. Look for disparities related to race, class, gender, disability, et cetera. Tell me what your task is and I'll provide you the redacted data. So, GPT is very, very low cost, if, and I'm sure lots of you have it. And you can actually put in a fair amount of data now in with the, with the team plan. And so you can upload some of your transcripts, some of your conversations, provided you're not contributing any privacy issues. And you can get it to an assumer role like an equity-informed facilitator, and you'll be stunned at the type of things um, that it brings back to you some of the implicit things that work within the data. Of course, it's not without bias, but neither is me reading the transcripts. So what I find this does is I'm not asking it to write something, I'm asking it to help me look at the data in a different way that I wouldn't normally. Or wouldn't normally. I'll give you another example here, uh, forensic analysis. So this one's cool. Your task is to break down qualitative data such as interviews, written text by analyzing specific word choices, tone and language patterns. You can identify implicit biases, power dynamics, emotional undertones. Again, a different type of role uh, and it gives you new nuances, new ways to think about the data once you've uploaded it. You can do this with any role you want. Maybe you want to analyze the data from the perspective of a counselor. Maybe you'd like to analyze the data from a perspective of a community group who doesn't want affordable housing in their backyard. You can choose truly anything you want just try to unpack this information and challenge your own thinking. And it's very, very low cost. And for, you know, 50 interviews, if you had say 50 interview notes, ChatGPT is very, very um, good at handling that amount of data. Okay, so now it's the good stuff. Introducing housing needs assessment toolkit. So the group of you who are left here, you are first to hear it. Um, and this will be released on October 31st. So what we've done, it's a free toolkit. It's not a, you know, it's not, not going to do it for you, um, but it is going to give you some things to kind of practically implement. I hope that it'll save you time, but also if you're able to kind of push your thinking. So we've provided a framework of all the different types of things that you may want to address within a housing need. And we have a discussion on what are some of the pros and cons and how might you go about doing that. We've also created a giant list of um, indicators, so quantitative indicators. So on the left, you can see, and we've marked which ones align to the federal template. Uh, we also have a BC one, so if anyone needs that one, we can give it to you. And then we've also done some suggested tables. So tables you might wanna consider putting in your housing needs assessment, and those actually tie to your indicator codes. Where possible, we've um, listed the source. Of course, if it doesn't exist for your community, it doesn't exist. But we wanted to create kind of an all-in-one, one-stop shop that went beyond kind of the minimum requirements in the federal template. We've also, which I think is cool, we have a 160-item qualitative data framework. So things, it's a sheet you can look at and you can work with kind of stakeholders in your community to say which of these things are important for us to know in regards to creating a survey or doing interviews with residents or stakeholders or development or developers, excuse me. This, you can really easily, and it's in the toolkit, shows you how to move from this to interview protocol using ChatGPT or something similar. Or if you'd like, you can do it by hand, but it just gives you some inspiration of things that might be most useful in your housing needs assessment. Oh, this is in the wrong area. We've, oh, here we go. We've also included a bunch of prompts. And, and for those of you not comfortable with ChatGPT, that's fine. For those of you that it's not allowed in your organization, absolutely fine. 
for those of you that uh, it is an option, we've included some things that you might want to do. We've also included some tips on redaction. So when you're taking qualitative data, uh, how you can prepare it. Again, please speak to your own privacy office if you have one, but just some ideas on how it can help you save time and increase the depth of analysis. That's it. And last question, and I'll turn it over to you. How do you think AI can change how we approach not only housing, but other complex societal challenges? And if you think it's bunk and it's actually not appropriate right now for complex social challenges, that's a good answer too. Sick question here while I'm, um, oh, I see the chat now. Okay. On, on the ground data collection, you end up with a big bias because dissatisfied people are more likely to talk. Yes. So surveys are notoriously done by people who uh, know the mechanisms in which to register their complaints. That's why one of the biggest changes we made is the, these pop-ups is going and speaking to people. And we also do service-oriented interviews. So working with a service to say, we're going to bring a bunch of Tim Hortons gift certificates and we're going to park someone from our team and not disrupt your service and talk to people who are using services. So absolutely, we've really tried to kind of um, improve the equity of, of our data collection. Anna, how reliable is the data? Is that, um, I don't know when you sent that, but was that in regards to using ChatGPT for qualitative or was that quant? Okay, uh, so it's really, really good right now. It's quite good. It is not without a need to QA it. Um, and, and we're not throwing data in and saying, you know, write, write this up for my report. So how we're using it is tell me different angles, show me evidence from these interview notes of blank and like write out exactly where you got that from. So absolutely, there are uh, risks and, and pitfalls. The quality has gone up quite a bit. As August mentioned, there's also other LLMs. Um, so it does require human, it's not a one-stop, one-step issue. You have to kind of really work with it in QA, but we've been really happy with the results and have spent a great deal scrutinizing the results, great deal of time. I hope that answered your question, Anna. Yep, absolutely. If so, so I read a good quote the other day is AI doesn't help you. AI doesn't do the things you're good at better than you. Um, it helps you do the things that you're good at faster. Oh, awesome. And so if, when you're using it, if you're using it for things you have a strong knowledge base against, then you can QA it yourself. You're not just relying on the answer. Producing large, they're not practical. Yep. Puts up housing targets. It actually does a pretty good job, particularly if you put in the template. It can walk you through the logic. Yep, absolutely on quality of data. May provide an alternative viewpoint not considered. I really, really encourage you all to play with that act like a and pick different roles to, to flip the data. Okay, thank you, folks. Um, tell me, I think it consistent summarize 100 of studies. Yes. Uh, yes, particularly if you're looking for an easy to use chat interface, Claude does a really good job, a much better job than GPT of summarizing large pieces of information. So C-L-A-U-D-E, you can put in a ton of academic articles and get it to do a kind of a, a lit review. So imagine as a, a highly qualified uh, research assistant. Okay, any questions? And you can, I'm pretty sure you can take the mic. I don't know. I just work here. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Not related to ChatGPT. Okay. My team, do you have any things in the QA, Q&A box? Is Claude free? There is a free version. 
Um, there's a free version, there's a pro version, and there's a team version. Um, pro works perfectly fine for most people. The team version is quite good. You can hold more. Again, I would be remiss from a liability standpoint to just encourage all of you to check with your, your privacy um, people. But yeah, Claude is, is free. And then I think there's a low, I think it's a low cost, 12 bucks a month or something for the pro. Great. Um, so October 31st, you will all receive the housing toolkit. Yeah, August. So what we did is you'll see those because those are the, the federal requirements and the BC requirements. So we have included the 2021. The work I mentioned about the economic analysis and some of the climate analysis, what our uh, Dr. Matt Parker, our lead data scientist, is trying to do right now is how do we take some of those data sets that are released quarterly and monthly and use that to make um, particularly the economic ones to make kind of new inferences and understanding about what might be happening. Um, so that's, we haven't solved that the census is only five every five years, but we have, we're trying to focus on kind of new quantitative stories and then certainly new qualitative stories. Great. Okay, so you'll receive the, the toolkit. It's yours to use as you want, share it as you want. We hope it's useful. It includes surveys, interview questions. Uh, it doesn't include any of your specific data, but for those who are just starting, we, we hope it helps.